Welcome in our next guest. He is a fantastic writer. I've known him for a long time. He did some RSL work for the Trib and Utah football, and the Athletic continues to make moves. They've hired Chris Comrani to cover the University of Utah for the Athletic, and Chris joins the program now. Chris, what's up, man? How are you? I'm doing well, Spence. I just need to know what kind of cliff bar. Are we talking chocolate chip or macadamia nut? What are we talking about? So there? I actually went with, oh, you know what? I'm just realizing it was an RX bar. Oh, no. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Yeah, that's you my bad. That, man. That's my bad. So I'm probably going to get no sponsorships from either one. But it was the peanut butter RX bar, which is a favorite of mine. It's fantastic. Okay. For- I'm, more of a, I'm more of a chocolate chip cliff bar guy myself. Like when I'm traveling and I, and I, and I can't be that guy that like brings on my Cafe Rio on the plane. I'm just like, I'm just going to scarf down a cliff bar and just grin and bear it. And I, I would take your advice because between you and Falk, you have the hipster <laughs> hair and beard. So whatever you guys are doing as far as cliff bar intake or facial hair cultivation, I'm all about it, man. I'm all about it. Now, now I'm going to get the one who gets the sponsorship. So I appreciate that, Spence. <laughs> How you doing, man? You, you good? It's been a while. Yeah, I'm good. I'm just uh, getting used to this new life. Um, it's exciting. It's it's different, um, and that's kind of what I was going for. So I can't really complain. It's a lot of standing around scrums. I wasn't doing that for a long time. I kind of had the luxury of kind of floating on my own back in the day at the trip with my old job. But now I'm just kind of getting uh, back on the horse, so to speak. So so how did this come about, Chris? Before we get into the nuts and bolts of what you're seeing up there, I always and and anyone who I who I've interviewed, they'll tell you this. I always kind of like to ask you a few personal things like uh, get to know the the subject before we get into actually the nuts and bolts things how did things come about when the athletic called you that ultimately le- led you to this landing spot <clears throat> um yeah so they reached out and kind of uh, took my temperature and i'd be lying if i said it was an easy decision because it wasn't um i selfishly said i had the uh the best job in sports media in terms of, you know, being able to do whatever I wanted to do at the Tribune. And I always tell people when the athletic calls, you have to listen. Um, I've been a subscriber for a long time. There's a reason why I subscribe. Um, As most people know, you want to be, feel validated for the stuff that you pay for. So, and I've always felt like since day one, um, I've always come across things that I'm very interested in. And the athletic, as you know, just does, does things a little differently. And that's kind of my catchphrase. So when they came, uh, they came a calling. I had to listen, and I eventually just decided that, you know what? Why not? I'm I'm a millennial. I might as well make my resume a little different. And if you guys have not subscribed, I would recommend doing so. I mean, I love the NBA stuff. When Frank Isola actually was texting with Frank when he was let go of the Daily News, and I said, "What's next?" and he said, "Hold on," and he sent me the link for the Athletic. I subscribed that day, and then I love Tony's stuff, and obviously. Um, you have great stuff as well. So, Chris, before we get into it, tell all of our listeners where they need to go, how they can subscribe to get your stuff. Yeah, all you have to do is go to athletic.com, and there's a seven-day free trial. And there, We have so many expansion uh, deals going on because the athletic is still expanding in various markets and various sports. So the odds are that in, you know once or twice a month you will come across a pretty good deal that will give you your first year pretty uh, pretty discounted, I'll say. Uh, but it's a seven-day free trial at theathletic.com. And, and one thing I tell people is you, when you get a subscription, you're not getting a subscription for the writer you follow or the team you follow. You get the entire website. And they just expanded to the U.K. Um, I'm a big soccer dork, so like I've been geeking out that you know the EPL is being covered full-time by The Athletic now. So it's, it's pretty exciting. Awesome. And check out Chris on Twitter. It's, it's easy. It's just at Chris Camarani, which is K-A-M. R A N I. All right, Chris. So I was watching um, Talking Sports last night, and I saw Lecky Foto and Julian Blackman interviewed, and they both just had big smiles on their faces. And, and um, you know, Kyle Winningham's camps aren't easy. He works his guys, he works his players. Morgan Scally, same way. They're kind of tacticians. Their calling card simply is, "We're going to outwork you." But every interview I've heard, every soundbite I've seen, the players look genuinely happy. It seems like there's a really good feeling up there. Would you agree? Yeah, and and I think what's it, it is kind of odd in that like the competitions we're talking about is like the fifth offensive line spot and then the kickers. Like usually most teams have quite a few holes to fill coming into fall camp with, you know, departed seniors and, you know, Utah just didn't lose that much. So they just have so many talented guys back and a lot of guys um, had a chance to go for the NFL in the spring and they decided to come back for their senior year. And two of those guys are Julian and Leckie. Um, and I think it just goes to show that these guys wanted to come back. 
the Pac-12 South title or the Pac-12 championship game left a real sour taste in their mouth. And I think one of the main reasons why they're so happy is because they kind of feel like they're ready to do something big. And um, some Kyle Whittingham camps, like you said, they, they are very difficult. Sometimes it takes a little while to get things sorted out. But, I mean, if we're talking about the fifth offensive line position and the kicker as kind of the main talking points each day in camp, I think that kind of bears well for them going into the start of the season. You know, we were talking about this, JP and I were talking about this earlier, and the fact that you'd be hard-pressed to find a reputable Pac-12 preview that doesn't at least have Utah winning the, 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 the South, let alone winning the whole thing. And um, obviously expectations um, are, are all around this program, but it kind of flies in the face of the whole, you know, us against the world mantra that Kyle and, and, and Morgan and those guys kind of have a little bit. Have you noticed any difference to their approach now that they are not the guys chasing the target, but they're actually the guys with the targets on their back? It's a great it be something to be uh, keeping track of once the season starts. And then there's no better game to start off with than the BYU game, in my opinion. It's not a conference game, but this game is going to be a, a telltale sign of, is this team legit? Is it as good as everyone says it is? Because if it is, they go to Provo, they take care of business, they don't really have any problems. But as that game has proven the last decade or so, outside of that 54-10 to 10 game, this, that's always close. So I'm interested to see how these guys really take upon that pushing that's been laid upon them from the outside. Um, and, and, and see what it them. Because they, on paper, like you said, they are very talented and they should win the South. But in the past, they've always thrived when they are the underdog. And it's going to be a totally different thing now when they're the hunted and no longer the, uh, the hunter. A lot of people, Chris, and Chris Comrani is our guest from The Athletic, a lot of people curious about linebacker depth. Um, you know, one of the things that, um, that, that Kyle is, is so good at, that he excels at, is, is, is identifying guys and moving them around and putting them in positions to succeed. Like a Chase Hansen, who is now, you know, off to greener pastures. He's no longer there. Cody, Cody Barton gone as well. Um, Two-part question. How many linebackers, in your estimation, do you think are game ready? And how many other names are out there to provide that depth that they're going to need? Yeah, that's a, those are two great questions, and we talked to Kyle about that today uh, practice. He said he'd like to be six deep by the start of the first week of the season. Uh, right now, I'd probably say they're about four deep. And you got Francis Bernard, you got Devin Lloyd. Uh, they're really high on Trenton Carlson, this JC transfer from Ventura. But he was banged up a little bit, Kyle said, and he was out for a couple of days, but he was back today out there. Um, they're really high on Sione Lund, the Stanford transfer who came back, had to sit out last year. But he's a former running back that's never played a down of linebacker in the Divi in Division One football yet. So, um, you know, Utah's had a pretty good track record of turning guys around at various positions and getting them to succeed. Um, but they're already dangerously thin at that position. I guess I would say the one, uh, you know, luxury is that you're playing behind probably the best defensive line in the country and playing in front of a very, very talented secondary. So not to discount the linebacking core at Utah because, you know, Morgan Scali has told me ad nauseum that it's the hardest position to learn in his defense. But I think there's something to be said about being able to just be surrounded by really talented guys to kind of ease that transition. You know, Tyler Huntley, Chris, was really having a, a, quietly a, a very solid, solid junior year before the injury. And some games were more than solid. Some games he looked elite, like potentially – um, finally, a guy that we can talk about, not in the Brian Johnson neighborhood, but maybe knocking on some doors and looking at housing prices in that neighborhood. <laughs> um, and now he's a senior. He's got a new offensive coordinator. What are you seeing from Utah's quarterback? Yeah, it's it's going to be a big year for Tyler. And uh, I think everybody knows that he's working really hard at just getting bigger and stronger. The last two years, he's just ran into the injury issue. And that happens when you're a running quarterback. He told us on the first day of camp that he added 25 pounds of muscle, and I even asked him today what his uh, you know personal goals are for 2019 his senior year, and he just said play every game. So that he's not talking about stats or anything like that. It is going to be really interesting, I think, to see how Andy Ludwig employs a mobile quarterback in a run-first offense. I think you're going to see Tyler run a lot. I think a lot of people are assuming that because he'll be – under center and they'll be handing the ball off to Zach Moss and a bunch of other running backs that Tyler won't run along. I think you're going to see Tyler on the run, play action passes. There's going to be a lot of plays wide open down the field. Um, and he looks noticeably bigger. And we, we say that every fall when guys come back from, you know, chowing down on whatever they've eaten over the summer. But I, I, I'm very fascinated to see how quickly Tyler picks up Andy's offense. 
And I do think if they can get Britton Covey ready to go earlier, um, they could they could be pretty good offense. The defense obviously is going to be number one, but I think if they can remain healthy early on, it's going to be a pretty good offense. Outside of Britton Covey, Chris, do they have enough playmakers on the outside? Because it seems like every year during camp, you know, we hear from from guys on the offensive side like, oh, we've got burners outside. They're going to do this and that, and for whatever reason, it doesn't quite work out. I'm not sure why, but as much as everybody loves Zach and the the stable of running backs and and potentially, you know, the ability to run the ball down people's throats to stay balanced. You've got to have some playmakers on the outside. Outside of Britain, do they have those guys? Yeah, that's a great question. Right now I would say no because no one's really proven themselves. But uh, Jalen Dixon has uh, turned a lot of heads this camp. He, he really came on at the end of last year. Kyle said that – Kyle said last week that, he, in his opinion, Jalen's one of the better deep threats in the country, which is saying something. I think they need to have a really big year out of Solomon Enos. Um, he's one of those rare, big-bodied receivers that Utah usually doesn't have um, to be able to have him on the outside. And I think Demar Simpkins needs to have a really big year too because Tyler and Britton had a pretty good rapport last year, but I think teams are going to figure out once again that Britton is usually open and they're going to try to take him out of the equation. So those second and third guys need to step up. But for me, I think Solomon Enos definitely has to be the guy that steps up and just kind of takes control of the offense when he's open and, you know, get those deep balls where when Tyler lofts them up to him, he has to use his big 6'4 frame to go up and get them. You know, Chris, I know that um, the University of Utah historically tight-lipped about injuries, and I understand why, and they're not the only ones. Certainly it's not a, a trade that's exclusive to them. Um, but there's been some conversation about the health or lack thereof of Zach Moss. I know you got to be careful because you want to keep those relationships alive, but <laughs> what's your understanding of where Zach is at and – and if he can't go, do they have enough depth at that spot? So we asked Zach last week. He was made available to the media, and he said um, he's fine and that he will be ready to go on August 29th at Provo. Um, I think if we wait another week and if there's some something, some other things to be seen or heard that maybe prove otherwise, then we probably have to you know turn up the heaters a little bit. But um, right now you're still, what are we, the 12th, 17 days away from the first game. Um uh, We'll see what happens in the next week or so. I think Utah does have is lucky enough that they have pretty uh, good running backs behind Zach and Jordan Wilmore, this true freshman guy. Kyle just really can't stop talking about, it, which is rare because Kyle usually doesn't single out young guys. But pretty much every practice, Jordan Wilmore is the first name out of Kyle's mouth, which is saying something because true freshman running backs don't necessarily come in and make their mark right away. Uh, but there's a reason why they were so stoked when he flipped and, and committed to Utah in the spring. Um, and Devin Brumfield has been really impressive as well. So I think they have the if, – if Zach isn't able to go on August 29th in Provo, I think it would make the game obviously a little more difficult because there's so many more circumstances swirling around that game. Um, and I think they have the uh, – they're lucky enough that they have a pretty good group behind them. Chris, last thing, we'll end on this, and I'll set you loose. You know, everybody around here, if you've been in this market for more than just a minute, you've got to take on the rivalry game. You've got to take on BYU-Utah. Um, personally, and we're going to talk about this coming up on the other side of a break, I enjoy the game. I always have. It reminds me of growing up, and I'm old enough to remember when BYU just kicked Utah's head in year, out, year in and year out. <laughs> and now my son is of the generation where he can't fathom the fact that BYU was ever better than Utah. Kind of a funny dynamic, but right, yeah. And it was, so, what's your take on just this game in general? Not specifically in 17 days, just this game in general. Oh, I just this is not going to earn me a lot of fans in the Utah fan base, but for me, it's, it's a it's a must. I know it's tough because Utah is going to want to expand its non-conference scheduling, and I think a lot of teams might necessarily want to have wouldn't want to have BYU as their second best non-conference game. But regardless, besides all that, like you just have to have this game. It captivates the state and this culture unlike anything else. Like the Jazz are the biggest deal in town, but nothing like makes everybody glued to the TV like Utah BYU. And it's not a conference game anymore. It doesn't matter. It's not the last game of the season. Um, there's no Mountain West Conference title on the line or whatever like there used to be. But for me, it's just, it's number one. There's there's no maybe maybe when SC comes to town, there's something like familiar to it. But for me, like. When you're up in the press box for Utah BYU, like you feel it, and you don't necessarily feel it for Utah, Oregon State. Nothing against the Beavers or Utah, Arizona. Nothing against the Wildcats. But there's something to be said about the, how deep this rivalry runs in this state. And uh, I mean, there's a reason why people are going to be talking about it at church the Sunday before and the day after. 